Okay, episode 529 with Mr. Bill Bangston is going to be brought to you by PEMF. And if you guys are unfamiliar with this, this is a really great and unique technology that allows you to use pulsed electromagnetic fields into your body. PEMF therapy has been used for many, many years, and it helps to decrease pain, helps to reduce inflammation, it increases your range of motion. It's great for fast functional recovery. It helps with arthritis improves circulation, it promotes bone healing, Uh, it helps to reduce muscle loss after surgery and increases tensile strength in your ligaments. It also helps with faster healing of skin wounds, nerve repair, cell regeneration, relieves pain, increases your range of motion, enhances capillary formation, acceleration of nerve regeneration, decrease of tissue necrosis after an injury, it relieves symptoms of depression. It decreases diabetic factors. It helps with migraines. PEMF is an amazing, amazing new technology that I would highly rec- recommend you check out. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out as well on our show page here. We're also brought to you by the Rapid Release Technology Pro 2. I would not want to live without this tool. This tool is an amazing tool that uses vibrational energy. And I actually used it after my back pain issue that I had. I had a debilitating back injury in June of 2016 for the entire month. I could barely even walk. And this pain was so bad that after about a week and a half, I was getting worse. And it wasn't until a local practitioner came in and used this Rapid Release Pro 2 on my back that it actually opened up. I use it every single day. I use it in a variety of ways over all my organs. I use it on my face. I can't make any claims here that it does anything, but uh, chiropractic practitioners around the country are starting to use this now in their practice. And uh, I would highly recommend check out the Rapid Release Pro 2. Watch the videos about it in our store and you can learn more about everything that it will do for you or can do for you. It's an amazing piece of technology. So if you guys are interested in the Rapid Release Pro 2 or the PEMF therapy. They're both available in our store and I'll put a link to them at extremehealthradio.com slash 529. Right. Episode 529 today. Today we have a great guest. We call him Bill Bankston, Dr. Bill Bankston, but he prefers, he says, he just told me before we started the show that he prefers to be called Bill, so we'll call him Bill. His website is bankstonresearch.com, and we're going to be talking about, um, I, I heard a few interviews with him, and he's got some really, really fascinating information that I think is really important and really intriguing. And uh, he says he's a skeptic, and I like that because I'm, I'm skeptical as well. And he's very scientific, and, uh, but he talks about energy healing. So we're going to be talking in today's show about image cycling technique, resonant bonding. Uh, we're going to be talking about his book, The Energy Cure, Unraveling the Mystery of Hands-On Healing. Uh, And let me go down and read to you a really interesting part of his bio. He's a uh, professor of sociology at St. Joseph's College in New York. Uh, He received his PhD from Fordham University in New York in 1980. And he says his day job, uh, his uh, specialization includes research methods and statistics. But here's what's interesting. Not that any of that wasn't interesting. But he says here, uh, his healing research has produced the first, now get this, the first successful full cures, that's right, the C word, of transplanted mammary cancer and metho, let me get this word, methochlora, golly, I can't even say this word, he's going to have to help me here, uh, induced sarcomas in experimental mice by laying on of hands techniques that he helped to develop. He's also investigated assor- or assorted correlates to healing such as geomagnetic and micro pulsations and EEG harmonics and entrainment. So let me just go ahead and turn down the music so that he can hear me correctly. Let me turn his microphone up. Bill, are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. Thanks for having me on. Yes, I'm so glad. uh, You know, I heard you and um, I heard a few of your different interviews online and uh, I thought right away I got I got to talk to you because um, some of the things that you're showing in your experiments uh, it just blew my mind. So 
Um, but you know what? Another thing that really drew me towards you was that you said you first got involved in this sort of energy healing uh, as a result of a back issue. And I have a back issue, so I thought, okay, this is this is just perfect to talk with you. Yeah, you know, if something happens to you personally, it, it kind of gets your attention a little bit more than abstract stuff or reading about what happens to somebody else. And I had had a chronic bad back, uh, had given up a college swimming scholarship, you know, 105 years ago. <laughs> and and uh, so I just kind of lived with pain. Mm-hmm. And then this crazy lunatic comes along, puts his hands on my back, and, and I have been pain-free ever since, um, which is, is, you know, pretty pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. um, and, and so I guess there's two roads you can take. One is to say, well, that was interesting, then let's, let me get away from this as quick as possible, mm-hmm. or two, try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And, and so for better or for worse, I went down the second road and uh, been trying ever since no. to figure it out. Uh, but I am a skeptic. No. I remain a skeptic. What was the issue with your back? Did you get any scans or x-rays or anything? I have had the scans and the, and the tests and the, and the manipulators and all those things. And, and it was just, I, I mean, I guess you'd just call it a chronic bad back. Mm-hmm. Um, not without a specific, I didn't have any particular skeletal issues that I was aware of. But I was a butterflyer, and uh, you kind of need to arch your back and butterfly. you got to have that. And yeah. after about 100 meters, I just lock up. And I just make it through the day by stretching my back out and probably got a zillion people in the audience with bad backs uh, Mm -hmm. or just pains. uh, And you just stretch it out and you try to live with it. I just assumed it was life. But it turns out it went away. That's so fascinating because I had a um, an injury in the gym about probably what's going to be about two years ago now where I was doing bent over rows. And for anyone who does uh, works out in the gym and knows what bent over rows, uh, it puts really, really, it compromises your lower back. And something just exploded when I was doing it. And I'd never felt pain like that before. And ever since then, I've had just a really, really uh, tight back and a really um, a back that was really prone to, um, you know, doing something that's damaging the nerves there. And so... When you when this person laid their hands on you, um, how long ago was that? Oh, really? Uh, it's probably it was in the early seventies. Early seventies. So at that time, yeah. you were probably completely skeptical, right? Oh, I, yeah. I, I'm skeptical <laughs> in in the sense that um, I, I don't default to belief in anything. Uh, there there are folks in my experience who spend way too much time defending beliefs. Uh huh. And and a skeptic to me is somebody who's interested in looking at something, but will will withhold conclusions, uh, and and try to see if if you've thoroughly looked into into whatever you're looking into, mm-hmm. uh, without trying to come to a conclusion first. Mm-hmm. And and so I remain skeptical about healing research. I remain skeptical about testimonials. I remain skeptical about all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was spending some time skeptically looking into this guy who fixed my back uh, before he fixed my back, uh, and he had claimed to have certain types of psychic uh, abilities, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in psychometry, token object readings. So I'm pretty good at designing studies, and so I designed what I think were foolproof studies trying to make his effect go away. You know, Mm -hmm. I assume somebody's kidding somebody or you're kidding yourself or something like that, and he beat me. You know, I couldn't beat him. I could not beat this guy. He was... uh, very strange, so I, I don't believe the stuff I saw. I saw the stuff I saw. You know, it, it, it's belief is, is it becomes uh, in, not particularly relevant to anything. So what kinds of studies were you setting up with this guy? Well, for example, he, he alleged to be able to do diagnoses by holding objects that belong to a person or had some association with a person. So uh-huh. I broke a whole bunch of um, rules, uh, laws. I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but uh, <laughs> I think it, the statute of limitations is over. Yeah. So I, I had a friend at a hospital who was able to uh, convince a nurse in admissions to get people to sign, some people to sign a, a blank index card, put that into an opaque envelope, put that into another opaque envelope, I just get a big eight and a half by eleven, big opaque envelope uh, that would then be given to me. I had no idea what was in it, mm-hmm. uh, and then hand it to him and say, "What's what's their physical problem?" And then we could go in, break some more laws, and check medical records. Wow! 
So this guy was, you said, um, beating you in, in the studies. Well, in the sense that we only got eight people dumb enough to sign a blank index card as they got admitted to a hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I thought I had had gotten them. I thought he, he had missed one diagnosis. I thought he only got seven right. Uh-huh. Uh, but it turns out the hospital had made a mistake, and the person was readmitted later with uh, what he had originally said. Wow. And how did you come across this guy? Where, where did he come from? Uh, he was just uh, uh, hanging out in a, in a pool in Great Neck where I was a lifeguard. Wow, and you just by chance? I, I guess nothing's by chance, right? Um, oh, I have no idea. That's past my pay grade. Yeah, <laughs> but but, but uh, we we just met up. I was lifeguarding, and he claimed he was a psychic, and I went, yeah, I'm a skeptic. You know, let me test you on this. Let me test you on that. So I did some preliminary things, and man, he was good. He was good. You know, it's interesting too because a lot of people are skeptical, but they're skeptical in in a way where they're not willing to look at information in terms of. Um, having an open, it's one thing to be skeptical with an open mind and saying, you know, I really want to get to the truth of, of a matter, regardless of whether or not it, it coincides with a pre existing belief that I have. Yeah. Or it's another thing to be skeptical. And a lot of times people just say, well, I'm skeptical, but I'm going to hold on to that skepticism and not be willing to open my mind to anything. And I think a lot of people are, are the latter. Yeah, I don't think, I don't consider that skepticism. I consider that mindless belief. Yeah. I, for example, have brought some, I've been invited to give talks in skeptic societies, uh-huh. which is always fun. Yeah. And, and you walk into an auditorium and there's, uh, you, you know, a hundred people sitting there, arms and legs folded, and they have scowls on their faces. Uh-huh. And, and they, they, they're uh, knotted themselves into a pretzel, and, and I usually begin by insulting them because it's my strength. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I, I say something like, I'm the only skeptic in the room. And then they go, harumph, harumph, no, we're the such and such skeptic society. And I say, you're not really a skeptic. You already know that the stuff I haven't even yet said is wrong. Um, you're not open to anything. A skeptic should be open right. and critical. And you, you already have your minds made up. That's, uh, that's mindless belief. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, and a lot of people are like that, aren't they? They, they, uh, yep. they just have a pre predetermined sort of worldview as to what's real and what's not rather than there's nothing wrong with a healthy dose of skepticism. I think it's, I think it's, you know, when I was listening to your previous interviews and you were saying that you're skeptical and you're logical and you do scientific research and, you know, I think we need more of that. I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, I don't think people take as true blindly thinking that they're true and just being sort of tossed to and fro by the wind um, but I think it's refreshing to have your level of skepticism. You know, I think people need more of that. Well, I can't imagine being otherwise. Uh, I, I just, and in, in the sciences too, you run into folks who they have their minds made up. I mean, they actually believe their own press. Mm-hmm. They believe their own textbooks. They believe their own whatever they believe in it. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we don't know a whole lot about how the world works, really. I like what you said in one of your previous interviews. You said something to the effect of just start, just start with the assumption that you're wrong about everything and then just relax. Yeah. Oh, it's very freeing. <laughs> it's very freeing. Yeah. You, you know, just give up all your, 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 all your beliefs are wrong. So yeah. just relax. Relax. Don't defend them. They're not worth defending. They're all wrong. And Even you know the belief what? that all beliefs are wrong is wrong. So just relax. Yeah, and those beliefs existed before we were here anyway, so what does it matter? Yeah, and and the next the, the belief that overturns the belief that's now will also be wrong. Yep. And don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> just it's it's not worth it. It's more fun to go wide eyed and see how nature works. Uh huh. And really trying to just figure trying to reinforce and and be with your own tribe and you know yeah. you see this all over the place. It's it's uh, it's scary. Yeah, and when you get too much of that, it starts pe- people start to become fanatical and less less interested in looking into opposing opinions. I mean, as you can imagine. As the host of this show with 529 interviews, we have people talking about, you know, raw food. We have people talking about energy medicine. We have people talking about eating animal products. I mean, every different type of conceivable advice that people will give for what's really going to be good and healthy for you. And then we'll have people write in or, or, um, you know, email in and they'll say, this person's right. This person's wrong. And, you know, it's just, um, you know, there's going to be right and wrong and people debating each other until the end of time, really. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And that, that's not debating, that's bullying. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm just against it. 
the, the, I just be skeptical about everything. You're wrong about everything. That's a good thing. Relax. Yeah. No big yeah. deal. Um, as a professor, as a professor, I should say of sociology, um, and a PhD and all of that good stuff. Did you run into any sort of um, any type of people that were coming up against you for some of these beliefs that you were looking into? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, the, I there's um, the, I, I get that at my home institution from time to time. It depends on who's in office. Uh-huh. Uh, but the the I can speak more generally to that. Uh, the I, I'm the president of the Society for Scientific Exploration. Uh, and that is uh, an international group of nerds, geeks, and misfits who uh, look into unorthodox things uh-huh. uh, and try to do so in a rigorous way. Uh, so we, the, the society uh, was founded by a, a small group of, of folks 30-something years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were, they were in pretty elite spots. So you had the Dean of Engineering and Applied Physics at uh, Princeton, uh, the head of astrophysics at Stanford, the head of astronomy at the University of Virginia, folks like that who were interested in things past the textbooks and, and really wanted to take a look at how the world works and not be afraid because they they had gotten grief. People get fired in academia if they look into things which are unorthodox, and mm-hmm. they said it's time to have a rigorous society looking into what you call anomalous phenomena. Mm-hmm. And anomalous phenomena just means stuff that doesn't make sense based on the, our current understanding of the way the world works. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means it doesn't make sense. Right, right. And so, you still can't explain what happened with your back, right? Exactly. So yeah. some lunatic comes along, puts his hands on my back, goes hocus pocus, not really, but does, puts his hands on my back and I haven't had a pain since. Well, it happened. You know, I don't. you have to decide whether I'm making this up, mm-hmm. but I know what's real, you know, what happened to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, again, I'm, it's not a question of belief, but no matter what textbook you look at uh, from whatever institution and whatever discipline, that's not going to make sense. Mm-hmm. Right, and right. so that becomes an anomaly. Well, I think one of the issues is that people will say, well, you know, we have to have some sort of structure of how the world works, and if we don't, then there's, what, 330, 360 million people in the United States, and every one of those could have their own sort of weird, woo-woo way of looking at the world. And if we were to actually uh, look at everything with an open mind, we would never come to any conclusions because we'd be too busy. It's sort of like the people who say, well, we shouldn't have multiple political parties because if we did, then, then the actual vote would be diluted if there's 15 different parties. Now, but... That's not really what's going on because, you know, some you you know, some people can look and see through things and some people are just clearly not telling the truth about things, right? Yeah, I yeah, I would I would agree. Yeah. And 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 but the the interesting thing about the society, for example, and uh and, and I would I'm I'm a complete believer in the mission, um, is that you're looking for evidence. So if I tell you a story about my back, uh, you know, it, it really implies once upon a time and, and, you know, he's telling a story and that's cute, but that's not evidence. <laughs> right, right. Can we do something in a systematic way to bring about evidence that can be independently verified? Because you don't even have to assume that people are sneaky or nasty or, or, or trying to deceive in some way. You can deceive yourself. So let's put out there here's what I did, here's what I found, this was my procedure, this is my protocol, this is everything, and make it public. And so you come to an SSE meeting, and you're going to hear a public statement about methods and results and all those kinds of things, and and so they're independent of of belief. Here's what you do, try it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, what if they are unable to replicate the results? Oh, that that would be interesting in and of itself. Mm Mm-hmm. So we even had a session on replication problems in all disciplines. And it turns out uh, that not many disciplines have a whole lot of replication in anything. Really? Yeah, there's very little that's replicated. Uh, There's no glory in it. The the, the glory is being the first one to publish in a peer-reviewed journal. 
but once you've published something in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, to come along and just try a replication uh, doesn't have the same uh, one-two punch that uh, <laughs> you as the original discoverer. Yeah, it's not going to bolster your career any, right? No, yeah. no. You're just, you're just sniffing around. Yeah. So turns out in, in very few disciplines is there much replication at all. Uh, and that, that's just the culture of the discipline. Well, sci- uh, the scientific method and the scientists will, will say otherwise, right? But um, whether or not what they're saying is true remains to be seen because not all of us have, have tested everything. Um, but that's interesting. So you say a lot of, a lot of um, these things people are talking about can't be replicated by other people. They're not. Yeah, they're, it depends how close you want replication to be. Uh, the, there's a very common misunderstanding out there. Uh, in the world, uh, when someone says something is significant, that they, it's often seen as, well, therefore it's important. Mm-hmm. And significance and important are very different ideas. Uh, not, not to go geek on you too much, but if you, if you say something is, for example, statistically significant, all it means is it's probably not nothing. Right. That's all it means. It's probably not nothing. That's an interesting way of saying something, statistically what was the word you used? Significant. Gosh, like that's the, yeah, statistically significant in Geekland a, just means it's an arbitrary cutoff point, and you say it's probably not nothing. It's probably not nothing, yeah, because it depends on what someone means by the word significant, right? Well, significant just means probably not nothing. Mm-hmm. But if you're in your parlance, if you think significant means it's important or if there's a big effect or something like that. So you take a drug that's been tested in a trial... And you say, well, this has had significant results to relieve X, Y, and Z. Well, that's terrific. Well, what is the effect size? Mm-hmm. You know, and you find out there's almost nothing happens, but it's probably not nothing. Mm-hmm. And so all sorts of people are misunderstanding when some, they say something is significant. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's all over the place. Yeah. Gosh, and then s- uh, a replication, uh, <laughs> well, if you have very little effect size. So an average effect size in, in, in most experiments is about explaining about 4% of the phenomenon. Okay, 4%. That's it. Wow. Which, the inverse is, of course, that 96% of what you think you're explaining, you got nothing. But I say I have a significant finding. <laughs> well, okay, but how about all the other stuff you don't know about? <laughs> right. I mean, look at, it, look at astronomy. Just, just take astronomy. About 95% of the universe isn't even visible. Mm-hmm. It's dark matter and dark energy. What does that mean? Well, you know, there's stuff out there. We don't know what it is, but it's got to be out there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting, a similar kind of a, of a number. Mm-hmm. So astronomers are looking out. They don't know what, what they're looking at. Yeah, it's so bizarre. So bizarre. And if you read the textbook, then you say, okay, I got a nice, neat package. But the fun is the research, and the fun is going, hey, you know, I really don't know the way the world works. So let me look at this star that way. Or let me look at somebody putting their hands on the back this way. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's so fascinating. We've had big name astronomers, for example, in the SSE question because we're questioners. They even question the Big Bang. Wow. Yeah, and I, can you bring in evidence against the evidence for the Big Bang? To Don't me, just assume it. Living life in that way, I think, to me, is one of the most exciting ways to view the world because we're taught so much of this is how the world is and this is how the world works and this is everything is scientific and reductionist and everything you know acts in a certain orderly way. But when you start looking at things and questioning things and being skeptical of what we're being taught. Um, yeah. and, and realizing, man, this world, there are exceptions to things and things do happen. And if you can prove those and look at those things with an open mind, it starts opening up your whole entire worldview as to what, what the hell is possible. Oh, you're liberated. Yeah. You can, really, you can, you can just relax. Yeah. What will the next data set show? Mm-hmm. What will the next experiment show? Realizing that you don't know. And not being connected, not being attached to the outcome of, of really anything, right? No, I have, I, yeah, I have, I have data that I expect to come from a lab in, within the next week. I wouldn't bet a nickel on the outcome. What, can you and talk about what that data is? The reason I don't is? bet a nickel on the outcome is because I don't know enough. Yeah. 
uh, maybe I'd bet two cents, but I'm not going for the full nickel. <laughs> Can you, you know, talk that's, about that's what that? Pa- again, past my pay grade, I just I, I have no delusion that I understand the way the world works. Yeah. But I am going to systematically look at every under every rock and look at and see and all those kinds of things. So going back to your back. Um, you were skeptical when this person claimed that he could, he could do something with your back. He yep. did something with your back. Yep. Um, how long did that take and what was, what were your thoughts afterwards and, and what, and how did you move from that, move on from that? Well, the, the, the question was, uh, um, well, first of all, how long did it take? In my case was was an exception to most healing rules. I would say that the whole process was about five minutes. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, if you treat bad backs or you treat things using healing of you know, unorthodox types of healing, uh, you don't see a whole lot of five minute fixes. Uh, at least I don't see a whole lot of five minute fixes. Uh huh. I think there's a dose response that, that occurs in healing and a variety of other things that we can actually quantify. But uh, in my case, for reasons I can't explain, uh, it, the whole thing was over probably in about five minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the question was, well, what else can you do? You know, so you did hocus pocus on my back. Should you try other backs? Should you try people with this or people with that? And so what happened after that is uh, both of us were pretty stunned at the result. Both of us were skeptical of the result, and then I, I dragged this guy around, you know, put your hands here, put your hands there, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And we saw certain patterns, and, and, and they, were, they were reasonably interesting. Um, benign growths, for example, didn't respond. Malignancies responded. With this guy? Yeah. So did you think at the time that this, is it... Was your thought, uh, w- was it such that you thought, okay, this person is, you know, has some unique healing powers in and of himself, or he's tapping into something that we can all tap into? And if he's doing the latter, were you wondering why he was having results with malignant and not benign? Oh, yeah. Y- yes to everything. Okay. So well, I, I watched it, and uh, person after person after person, and some things worked pretty quick, and some things took longer, and some things not so much. And it was it was it was a pretty curious phenomenon. But one one of the problems I had was if you if you see a couple of hundred people get cured, uh, I don't know what you learn out of it. Mm-hmm. So let's say you come in and you have X. Uh, whatever X is, doesn't make any difference. You have X, and some crazy person comes in, puts their hands on you, does whatever it is that they do, and then you're, you, let's make it real simple, you're better. Mm-hmm. Well, was it, was it the adrenaline that happened because you were in a novel situation? Was it something you ate? Was it something you didn't eat? Mm-hmm. You know, that morning you had a grapefruit. Uh, that morning, you know, this, or what, I, who knows? You or know, pl- and, and, placebo and so, as well? well? Well, placebo, I think, is a real phenomenon. I don't think it's, I don't think, I'm reasonably confident placebo is not psychological. We can get go down that path if you want, but I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably confident placebos have very little to do with the psychological effect. But uh, let's, let's call it just, is it suggestion? Is it this? Is it that? You know, uh, and, and in the case of people, it, it's it's pretty complicated. So I wanted to simplify things and take the gross observations that we saw in a clinical setting and bring them into the lab and and make it really systematic. Okay. And so that that was the route I took. Um, the, the the people were curious, but they weren't compelling enough. In that this person gets better, that person doesn't. I mean, what what you know what does what? I don't know. Yeah. What does that mean, right? Yeah. What does it mean? So were you at the time? Were you, so you were bringing this guy with you into the lab, and is that what was going on? I tried to. Uh, he he wasn't uh, oriented towards the lab, but uh-huh. uh, one day I met uh, a, a guy who became a lifelong friend, Dave Crinsley. Uh, he was at this guy's place, uh, bringing in a friend of his to get fixed uh, of, of something, and mm-hmm. and we started to talk and said, you know, it's 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 interesting to watch this stuff, but what can we do? And how can we make it more systematic, and how can we make it more um, airtight? Mm-hmm. And so 
Crinsley at the time uh, had a pretty good uh, appointment, a uh, serious appointment at the City University of New York, and he arranged uh, to have um, of, of the chairman of the biology lab uh, or the biology department uh, uh, put together some airtight biological studies that we could do under very controlled conditions. Really? Uh, and so the airtight studies were, for example, a mouse model, uh, a mammary mouse model that had already about 2,000 publications. Okay. So, I mean, this wasn't a, an idle thing. You know, so you can see how this is different than, you know, Fred walking in off the street and you go hocus pocus and Fred says, I feel better. Right, right, right. In this particular case, we got mice, which have 100% death in over 2,000 studies within 27 days after being injected with a certain amount of cancer. Okay. 100%. And 100%. It, it follows a beautiful statistical model of a normal curve and standard deviation of death is only three days. I mean, it's an incredible model, and that's why oncologists all over the place work with this, this mice. Now, these mice, were they all the same age or the same, everything was the same with them? Same everything, yeah. yeah. Okay. So traditional biological research. So you, you take the, the traditional biological research, and, you, and you, you know what's supposed to happen. You've got thousands of runs. Mm -hmm. And then if you're in traditional biology, you see what happens if you, I don't know, give them vitamin C. You mm -hmm. know, does that do anything? Does it change the length of time they live? You know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but the world's record, the Methuselah of all mice before me, was 27 days. 27, okay. So some were yeah, actually it, dying sooner than that. Oh, yeah. So they, they start dying about 14 days after injection, and then they peak in a certain amount. Most die, you know, plus or minus three days, and then the longest-lived mouse on the planet was 27 days after. Is there any, or was there, I should say, any um, looking into why some would die at 14 and some would die at 27? No, that's, a, that's actually a wonderful question, and it's almost completely ignored in traditional research. Yeah. We look at aggregate things, but we don't look at individual cases. Okay. Uh, so you're looking at, uh, uh, in the aggregate, if you do this therapy, what happens? But I've got to tell you that your question is, is, is something that is really important and is, is pretty much ignored in the research community. So let's, uh, let's say you take uh, cell cultures and you're doing some sort of radiation study. You mm -hmm. take HeLa cells, uh, commonly known cells, and you, you do a certain dose of radiation to them. Well, they're, they're published graphs that say if you give this much, uh, this much radiation, 50% live and 50% die. Mm -hmm. And then if you give another dose, 60% live and 40% die, you know, like that. Right, right. And so there, there's these charts that you can look at to compare your findings to what should be. Mm -hmm. But they don't ask the question, if 95% die at a certain dose, how come 5% live? Yeah, that's my question. I think it's a wonderful question. Yeah. And if you say that to a radiation physicist and ask that question, they'll just look at you. Is this, So that's just because they're trying to get, um, like you said, aggregate numbers and large numbers? Yeah. and, and yep. it, it, It's probably too too much. It probably goes too deep and it's too time-consuming and um, a misuse of funds to try to figure out what's going on in, individually with these mice, right? Well, I, I, kind, of, I, I kind of lean your way. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there ought to be a balance more looking at individual things. So, for example, let's say you look at spontaneous remission. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have spontaneous remission in, in, in whatever the condition might be, um, then, then and you say you go to a, a medical school and talk about spontaneous remission, they're, they're going to yawn, close their eyes, or run out of the room mm -hmm. because these are exceptions. And so you're safe if you just say, oh, this is an exception. I think you ought to pay attention to the exception and find out what in heaven's name is going on. Yeah, because there was a book I was reading a while back called uh, Mind Over Medicine by, oh gosh, I forget what her name was, um, P uh, PhD MD uh, lady, but she was talking about the um, spontaneous remission, and she was saying that she, she quoted some study that there were thousands of these uh, spontaneous remissions, not just yeah. with cancer, but with all kinds of things. And she was saying the same thing, exactly the same thing you're saying is, you know, how come we're not looking more into this? It's bizarre. Yeah, you ought to. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, a friend of mine, Larry Dossey, goes around to medical schools, talks about spontaneous remission, and then the, the, he says the, the, the folks come up to him one at a time, but they're almost embarrassed going, hey, wait, I've got to tell you another case. <laughs> but 
you can't talk about it publicly because it's the exception, you know. And it, it's like if something weird happens in in um, uh, in a drug trial, you say, "Well, it's a placebo," mm-hmm. and then you feel safe, right? As if anybody had any idea how placebos really work. Well, the thing that's weird to me is that you know, with spontaneous remission, I can understand from a scientific perspective and especially from a medical perspective that. It's like you said, the exception, because you don't really want to explore that because it gets into all kinds of stuff that you're not comfortable with. And I get that. But what's interesting to me is in terms of uh, the differences with these mice is that with humans, you could say, well, you know, maybe human, you know, this person was a very positive person or maybe this person was exposed to less chemicals yeah, in his house. Yeah. But with mice, at least according to what we think and know, there's not like, you know, positivity and affirmations and all this kind of weird stuff with mice. They're just mice and they don't have the ability to think that way. So it makes it even stranger that 5% would live beyond 14 days or up to 27 days. It's really well, weird. Yeah, and, and so you can work out the math of, of these mice that we work with. So what we did is um, we, went to, we went into the lab and way before you asked, did I follow this guy around and ask whether or not he was different, or can you do it yourself? Oh, right, right. And uh, <laughs> I eventually get to the answer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It takes a while before I get there. But uh, um, it turns out that, yes, he and I developed a way, we think, that would reproduce what he could do. Okay. It's completely separate from belief, and it goes to something you alluded to before, image cycling. Image cycling, right. Okay. And, and so we developed this image cycling technique, which he alleged, and I wanted to test, would reproduce the stuff that he could spontaneously do. And so what happened is uh, we got these mice, and then he decided he didn't want to do it. I kind of freaked out. Why didn't he want to do it? Uh, I'll leave that up to, to Sigmund Freud. You know? uh, okay. it's, it's also <laughs> past my pay grade. But yeah. he and I essentially went our separate ways. Interesting. After this, because it it, it it was very difficult to set up the first experiment. Huh. Is there that were because political he... ramifications, financial ramifications? There was a lot of ramifications, right, and right. we ordered mice, and then this this guy didn't. Uh, he decided not to do it, so it was left with me. And so I, who am not a healer, got a, a gaggle of mice with fatal cancer. And saying, here, go treat those mice. Mm-hmm. Now, what happened is, and these are the mice, 100% death within 27 days. So mm-hmm. I'm sitting there not knowing what I'm doing, really. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing this image cycling technique. Hello? Oh, yeah. No problem. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this image <laughs> cycling technique uh-huh. and um, uh, putting my hands around a cage of mice. And what happened is uh, I expected that if it was going to work and you got the mice soon after they were injected with cancer, I was thinking like radiation, you know, we'd zap them. Uh-huh. So we go, you know, zzz, zzz, do something like that. And, and, uh, but instead, the tumors grow. And I said, well, it doesn't work. You know, what are you going to do? Move on. Right. <laughs> and, and someone said, well, just do it a couple more days. You know, it was hard to set this thing up. So I went a couple more days. Tumors getting bigger couple more days, tumors getting bigger, and then they developed this blackened area on the tumors that nobody's ever seen. Biologists going, you know, what in heaven's name is this? So these were visible tumors on the outside of their body? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. And um, how many days at this point was it? Four? About four days? It was, it was probably about uh, 15 days. And how long um, each day were you doing this technique? To an them? hour. And, and, oh, and a full hour. Yep. Is that we didn't know what to do, so we just kind of arbitrarily made it an hour. Gosh, your colleagues must have think, thought you were crazy. Oh, without without question. So did I. Now, did this, I thought I was crazy too. Did this guy that you had spoken to, or that helped with your back, did he say that it should be an hour? No. No. Okay. No. I just, you know, you, 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 if you don't know what you're doing, which is us, um, you make something up and you start. You got to start someplace. What's interesting about this is that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the the mice. I mean, maybe we don't even know what the hell is going on with mice, but. The mice aren't believing anything is, is happening to them. It's not like they have to believe this is, is, this is happening. No, right? no. Yeah, they, 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 and that, that's the beauty of going into the lab. Yeah. So well, the, and they, using they, mice, too. 
They de- yeah, and they develop blackened areas on the on the surface of the tumor, and then the tumor itself starts to ulcerate. Now, and I'm jumping up and down, going, "Folks, it's not working." You know, you get you go to this idea of belief, <laughs> and the, the the tumors are splitting open. I'm I'm saying, you know, we got to stop this. Uh, we got to call this off. It doesn't work. Let's deal with reality here. A couple more days. A couple more days. Do a couple more days, and then the tumors suddenly implode, and the mice are cured. So how come, so you didn't even believe it was working? Oh, heavens no. So when the tumors started developing these black and um, um, spots on the outside of them, you didn't think what you were doing was changing the physiology of these peop- of these mice. You were just um, thinking that it wasn't working at all. Oh, yeah, clearly. I mean, without question. I had no sense that it's working. Oh. Um, and, and so the mice don't believe. I don't believe. Nobody believes. And then they're cured. So this, uh, this is they're, with they're, this is full lifespan cure, and and it and it goes even farther than that. We watch them for their entire lifespan, but more than that, they 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 get reinjected with the cancer, and it turns out they're immune for life. Okay, yeah, I want to get to this because this is fascinating. But I still have a couple questions about these mice. Now, this is yeah. with ten different mi- m- mice. Mice. How, how many? How many mice? Yeah, w- was this ten? No, the first one was just six. Just six. Okay, so yeah, the we, mice... we have them up to 75 at a time at this point, but uh, the first one was just six. With six m- mice. I don't know how you say that. Is it mice? Right, just six mice. Six mice. Okay, so yeah. you had six mice, and from the time of injection, they typically start dying off anywhere from 14 to 27 days. 27 is the outer limit. Outer limit. And then, so you had been going, so you decided to say, hey... After eight or nine days, you know that, hey, some of these mice are going to start dying in a few days, um, but you decided to stick with it, and so this was at day 15. Yeah, I don't think I decided to stick with it. I think I was browbeaten into sticking with it, because I don't believe the stuff. It's not going the way I thought it would go. Everything was going wrong that I could see, because they weren't certainly didn't look you know, good. They had these big, ugly-looking ulcerations on them and 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 you know this isn't the way i want the world to work yeah. <laughs> the feeling is real um and so i just kept going because i got browbeat into going on and it turns out that that was the right decision it's so fascinating to me that you continued doing it even though you didn't believe it but then also what's so when you were doing this technique sorry for so many questions i'm just so yeah. fascinated so when you were doing the technique uh you said you'd been going was it always one hour and did you take any breaks during that hour I don't think I took any breaks. Wow. Probably, I mean, I, it, it turns out it doesn't make any difference. So what? But it, the first time we did it, we just did it an hour a day, you know. An hour a day. So was it just you or did someone else work on just it Just well? me. Well, it wasn't supposed to be me. It was supposed to be the crazy guy who fixed my back. <laughs> but, but it, uh, you know, I, I got into this by default. Right. And then when, when the mice were cured, the first thing I needed to do was uh, replicate it because, you know, this had to be a fluke. Ah, so so I got I got a couple of, uh, of faculty members and I got a couple of students, all of whom thought I was insane. Uh-huh. Uh, and I said, perfect, because I, I, I'm not comfortable around believers. So I, I want people who think didn't know anything about healing, um, had no no beliefs to defend, um, and and just taught them the the, the healing technique. Uh, and then they each got a cage of mice. And the same thing happened to them. All their mice went through the exact same stages, and all of the mice were cured for life. And so we're sure that they were, in fact, injected with this cancer. Oh, yeah. Well, being a, I'll give you an idea how skeptical I am. <laughs> I said, well, then the lab can't be competent. So I went to a different lab. Oh, really? And had different uh, uh, inexperienced, non-believing people do it. And then I went to a different lab. At this point... I have 16 replications. I'm a little slow. 16 I replications guess. in five different uh, labs, right? Uh, no, I have, a, I have it in, in actually now in eight different labs. Wow. Four oh. medical schools. So now this is an interesting, I, I just thinking about how all this stuff works. So when you have, you said 16 replications, and so let's say you've replicated it um, at the time that you were doing this. You know, on your five or six replication, then you're going into a new lab, right? Let's say you go to a new lab and you want to conduct yep. this research and this uh, yep. study in a new lab. Um, and now you're going into it with a little bit of confidence, like, hey, this has already worked six or seven times before this. And when you're explaining that to the people whom you're going to be at the new lab with, what are their responses? Uh, usually I'm out of my mind. Yeah. 
<laughs> and they say, uh, well, they, they, the previous lab, if the mice are living, then the, the previous lab didn't know what they're doing. And I, and I would say, beautiful. Yeah. Kill these mice. Have a bowl. Gosh, that's um, so crazy. I'm not trying to ask you to believe anything. I'm saying, can you make this effect go away? Yeah, and this is what's happening. So The, the effect is the effect. You know, again, nobody's a believer in this. The, the, the folks in the lab, me, the healers, the, the volunteer healers, um, the stuff simply won't stop. Hmm. So why was it working? You said a few minutes ago, and I wanted to get back to it, about um, what were the two types of cancers? It worked on, it didn't work, or it did work on malignancy, but not on another kind? It, do, it doesn't, the technique itself doesn't seem to do all that much to benign growth. Okay. So, I mean, we, we have lots of data at this point on the things that it'll affect and the things it won't affect. Uh, not that they're, you know, true, but, but we have pretty suggestive data that indicate, for example, that we can fix cancer. Uh, I mean, that's not really an issue anymore. Uh, we, we know for a good amount there's a dose response. There's a minimum amount of treatment required because um, we, we've tried many, many experiments where you cut back very much and just to see how much do you need in order to produce cures, things like that. When you say cut back, do you mean cut back the amount of time that you're doing? Cut the- back the amount of time, yeah. Okay. So we, we've done experiments treating once a week, three times a week, five times a week, seven times a week, mm-hmm. 15 minutes at a time, a half hour at a time, 45, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing this for a long time now. Mm-hmm. And, and so we've got all sorts of permutations uh, uh, trying to understand what the patterns might be. And are these all in labs, right? All in labs, yep. And they're all with mice? No, right now, uh, there, I got 16 experiments with mice. Uh-huh. Uh, I got probably another 25 on cell cultures. Um, and, and it, it, you know, but, but they're all done in traditional labs doing traditional things. Now, with mice and cell cultures, that's, I mean, that's a whole different world, isn't it? Cell cultures, yeah. 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 So what, why is that so different? Because of just all the different things that are going on biologically with, uh, with mammals as opposed to... Yeah, p- p- cell cultures, I, I don't think, is the greatest way to, to do a serious test of healing, mm-hmm. but it, it, it might be uh, something that has to do with mechanism of action. So, for example, I'm, I'm running genomic data right now, uh, meaning we're trying to find out what are the genomic pathways by which cancer gets cured. And we've isolated uh, now uh, 10 promising genes that we, we think we may be onto something. Uh, so there may be, a, 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 we've actually tested at this point 70 different genes. What are the effects on cell cultures of applying healing on 70 different genes? So this is, we've gone way, way past, you know, the initial thing like, wow, here's a mouse, we made it better. Mm-hmm. You know, this thing is done with, we're doing reasonably sophisticated uh, traditional scientific analyses just on a crazy topic. Mm-hmm. Now, do we know how this type of energy work works with, we've had p- uh, different you know, neurosurgeons on the show and scientists and people that talk about um, and, you know, going a level deeper than genetic um, you know, uh, yeah. healing and things like that and going deeper in, into the mitochondria, which, which um, controls the uh, genetic expression. Do we know anything about how this, what you're doing affects the mitochondria at all? Uh, no, not specifically. Uh, we, we may end up getting there, but uh, I think if you get down to a particular level, you start to lose what the question is. Right, right, because that's so so deep. It's much deeper than is well, it? Well, even if you talk about things like up and down regulation of a particular gene, mm-hmm. you look at a big chart of a human genome, uh, it's not static. You know, you take a picture and you, you have the sense this is actually what it looks like. There is no thing out there. Mm-hmm. The thing's switching on, off, up, down, crazy. It's alive. Mm-hmm. It'd be like trying to take a picture of um, a person running down the street, but take a still picture and think you've understood running. Right, right. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's not going to work. Uh, so the mitochondria stuff is not, eh, it's, it's not as interesting as the kind of stuff we're working on. Yeah. Well, what's fascinating to me is that uh, the mice became immune to the cancer cell line that you were injecting them with, which is... So once they were healed, it wasn't like you could re-inject these mice with, and, and they would get another type of cancer, right? Well, it's even more than that. We can take blood out of them and put them into another infected mouse, and it'll cure that mouse. Whoa. Okay, say that again? Yeah. So once, once the mice have been treated, uh-huh. uh, you can use their blood or cells uh, and put them into a, an infected mouse with no healing, and it'll cure that mouse. 
Now, have you done, I'm sure you have because you're, you know, have, have been doing this. Have you taken the blood from a healed mice from cancer and then put it into a, a, a mouse that, you know, wasn't injected with cancer and did they ever get cancer? Oh, we never did that. Never did that. Interesting. We got a scroll of things to do, but yeah. uh, that, that, that's one of the things that we haven't yet done. Because there you're talking more about prevention, but what a bizarre thing. So, I'm so, reasonably confident at this point we know enough biologically that we could make a vaccine. Not for prevention necessarily, but that would fix it. But, but you know, that's never, it's never going to fly. So. But, but the problem would be with the vaccine is that you wouldn't be able to say this, you know, such and such chemical that we made in the lab. The, the vaccine would be more derived from the blood of healed mouse, yes. right? Yes. So, you know, obviously a vaccine company couldn't profit from that, right? Well, no, they could, but uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying a different route right now. I'm trying, a different, I'm trying to record the act of healing and to make it um, essentially a, a, a deliverable, scalable kind of a cure. What do you mean record it? Uh, we have got some um, uh, pretty sophisticated data at this point where we, 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 we get people who know my healing technique in a uh, big Faraday cage mm -hmm. with many, many sophisticated over-the-top devices mm -hmm. uh, that are detectors. So they detect geomagnetic fluxes. They they detect electromagnetic fluxes. They take they you know a variety of things. So we did uh, uh, thirty eight different detectors inside of a Faraday cage. Three people in there doing the healing technique, and we've recorded that. Uh, there's nothing that's actually recorded, but but whatever we're picking up, we've reduced to a stereo signal, and we've played those stereo signals to cancer cells, and they genomically change. How, really? So under the microscope, you can see what's going, like what happened, like wh what exactly happens to the cancer cell? Uh, they they recognize when this recording is being played. Oh my gosh! Uh, so if, if if we we stick them in an incubator, we play this recording to them. I mean, we're not really playing anything to them, but for for reasons that is right now past our pay grade, uh, the 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 cancer cells change as if the person was treating the cells. Now, why did you use a Faraday cage? And if, if you put these instruments inside a Faraday cage, wouldn't that compromise what the Faraday cage is doing? No, everything is grounded, and out, the stuff is on the outside, and the and you know, it, it, it's it's really an oh. over the top. Uh, wow. The amount of data we have, just to give you an idea, we had to build a water cooled supercomputer. Oh my gosh! Custom Jeez. because this isn't this isn't casual. You know, look at this lump on a mouse. You know, so are you, are you able to get funding for this kind of stuff? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this recording was a few hundred thousand dollars alone. I can't believe that. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so... So the question is, if this will produce a cancer cure, and we're in the middle of testing right now, then then we can make it downloadable. How so? Just the, the data? The would recording. Be the recording would be downloadable. Yeah, record. So you want it, you got a problem? So... It, you know, the stuff we're looking at, from a practical point of view, there's some things we seem to be able to fix pretty pretty uh, robustly. Uh, cancer responds, Alzheimer's responds, cataracts respond, you know, things like that. So, you got That's Alzheimer's, hit this button. That's so crazy, but Parkinson's does not, right? Parkinson's does not. Isn't that weird? Any idea about that? And that's that? a clue. I, it, the clue is past my pay grade, but <laughs> it, you know, but but something's going on here. You know that that uh, so far nobody's been able to do it. I mean, I teach people how to do this, uh, and and it's not just me. Uh, nobody who's learned a technique has made any appreciable dent in something like Parkinson's. Now. Forgive me for not remembering what you said about the Faraday cage, but were you were you using a mouse in the Faraday cage or a human? Uh, we we just had humans doing my my healing technique. I so see. So these these are folks who have taken my training. They know the technique. They've uh, they fixed a bunch of people, and so you you stick them in a Faraday cage and we record them intending healing, and we see what the thirty eight detectors can pick up. Uh, I've got electrical engineers and physicists working on the recording right now. They can't figure out what in heaven's name is in the recording, but it seems to be doing stuff. Hmm. So Ooh. bizarre. That's so interesting how Parkinson's doesn't respond. Maybe, who knows, right? 
Well, yeah. So some things, things that need to be where it's more difficult for us to treat something that you have missing. So if you're Parkinson's, you're missing something. Uh huh. Right. If you've got Alzheimer's, you've got junk on your brain. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be easier to take away stuff than it is to replace things that are missing. I see. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Now, how, wh what do you think the role is of the person that is seeking healing? Like, How does this translate to someone who is either open or not open to these types of techniques? I think, I think uh, there's a slight advantage to not being a believer. Really? Yeah. I think belief, probably all other things being equal, retards healing a little bit. Wow, that, I mean, wasn't, the ex uh, that wasn't the answer I was expecting. Well, if, you're, if you go through <laughs> life believing, and you know, fill in the blank whatever it is you're believing, uh -huh. you, you spend a lot of, of your personal time and energy trying to defend your belief, as we discussed early on. Right. And someone who just comes in and say, you know, I, 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 I don't know, Try. Let's see what happens. Is probably the ideal. So probably being in a more neutral, so not being against it, but not being for it either. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, that, I, I a guess place to be. a person who's in the neutral place has more possibility if you think about it, because they they have the ability to believe or, or not believe or have something work or not work. But if someone truly believes or if they're only skeptical, you know their possibilities for for them having something happen that would go along with their current worldview is 50% less. Well, think about so. a mice, a mouse. Mm -hmm. you, just, you offer, I mean, animals are wonderful for this. And I don't care what the animal is. They, they, don't, they don't sit there flopping on the floor wondering about, well, what will my neighbor think of me if I... They, they just, they mm -hmm. come over, they'll, they'll let you know when the treatment's going on and let you know when the treatment's going off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so dogs, cats, horses, pigs, sheep, we've done all these. Um, uh, they, they love this stuff. It's the people who get all squirrely. So have you found any differences with, I'm guessing you, you worked mostly with cancer cells. Have you found any difference in sheep and mice and, and pigs and things like that? Are, are, there, are there differences? The, well, we, the, those we've tried essentially on a clinical basis. Uh, we don't have large numbers of sheep and goats and stuff. Uh, we do have a sense that the larger the animal, the slower the process of being cured, and that's probably related to uh, metabolic rate. Yeah. So mice will get better pretty quick. Uh, rats will get better more slowly because they're bigger. Mm. I wonder if that would translate to a human being, you know, a seven-foot-tall human versus a five-foot-tall woman. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. We'd need a, a boatload of people, and it would be a difficult thing to pull off. But uh, I agree that's an important question. Yeah, because you know how they say certain people, certain people, if you're, if you're taller, you don't live as long, and typically sh shorter, smaller people live longer. And so it's, it's got to be with what you're saying, or there's got to be something to it in terms of metabolic And, and I think rece receptivity to healing is also, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty complex question. Mm -hmm. I suspect it also has to do with how old you are. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what your health is, you know, things along those lines. So if you take a, a, a five-year-old, uh, a five-year-old is, in, in, in a sense, composing. You know, they're becoming. Mm -hmm. If you take a 50-year-old, they're decomposing. Right. And so you can still fix a 50-year-old, but a five-year-old is going to be easier. So in terms of the, of the mice, uh, what age were they when they were all injected? Uh, it varies, but they're usually about six weeks. Six weeks, and how long are their lifespans? On Two average? years. Two years. So they're all about six weeks. So they're all pretty young, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, yep. was was any of these done? Like, wh why six weeks, and why not, you know, a year or two years? No, it's, it, these are just we're following typical lab procedures. Okay. So, that's so if the if the lab, uh, there's an established protocol. This is what you do. Everybody agrees on it. Mm. And the only thing that I'm doing differently is I'm introducing healing as a variable. Mm -hmm. So nothing else is is exotically different. The you, off the shelf mice uh, from the standard supplier, and you do it at six weeks. We've done it on female mice. We've done it on male mice. We, you know all that stuff. But we're just following traditional protocol and introducing healing as a variable. Hmm. Golly, that's so interesting. So what, in terms of, because your book is called The Energy Cure, if people are interested, we'll put a link to it um, at Extreme yeah, Health Radio. Yeah, I don't even believe 
believe there's an energy. You don't? Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably confident there's no energy in healing. No uh, energy. The, the, uh, I, I told that to the publisher, and they said, thanks for your input. <laughs> oh, and then we'll just call it the energy cure. We're calling it what we want to call it. <laughs> now, why uh, don't you think there's any energy? It doesn't diminish with distance. Mm-hmm. I have experiments at two inches replicated at 2,000 miles. Okay. And if it was energy, it would diminish with distance. So it doesn't diminish with distance. So you have people doing this. How how far is the farthest person you've you've seen do this? Uh, well, we we've got, probably got a few hundred cures in Australia. Wow, being dispensed where here? Um, in New York and California. Oh, you can't get any farther away from Australia. Yeah, you can't that. get a whole lot more more far. Yeah, I mean that's it's yeah you you pretty much maxed it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean it really doesn't diminish with distance. Um. You know that's not that's not like a new finding, but but it, it doesn't diminish. If it doesn't diminish with distance. It's not energy, certainly as we understand it. I think it's rather information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard and, you say and that. I, and I think you're we're we're supplying information through some process. I don't, passed my pay grade, but through some process, and that information uh, is is stimulated by the healee, not the healer. The information is stimulated, so the receiver, the person who needs the healing. Is the driving force. So, in what way are the driving force if they don't even need to believe this is happening? Oh, belief, belief is irrelevant. I mean, unless it retards it a little bit. So, what would uh, I've, co- got, I've got double blind studies inside, far- in, inside functional MRIs that show that the, it's the HEAL-E which uh, instigates the, the healing changes. Uh, the, yeah, it, it's, it's the HEAL-E. Uh, and it, it's certainly not related to belief. I mean, you know, how are you going to get a cell culture to believe? Right, or a mouse. Or a mouse. Right. So how is, so the heal E is somehow doing something with this information that you're... Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, what's going on? Do you have any idea? Well, I, I mean, I think it's an information transfer, but how it occurs, I don't know. I think I understand the carrier wave at this point. I think I know why it doesn't diminish with distance, but I think it's it's closer in analog to a radio station. You have a power source upon which you put an information packet, mm-hmm. and that rides a wave. I think healing works that way. The healing itself is an information packet, um, and uh, but I think that that it, it has nothing to do with energy. And this uh, this is also incidentally the case in in various types of cancer. It turns out. The more aggressive cancers are much easier to fix. Um, so if you have a really over-the-top aggressive cancer, it comes in like a freight train. It, it, it leaves like a freight train. Uh, you have a limping cancer that's slow-growing. It comes in slow. It leaves slow. And that all has to do with some kind of information because it's obviously getting its information from somewhere as well. From someplace else, yeah. But I think the energy is in the cancer itself. So the energy is there, but the information is being transmitted through this hands-on healing, uh, and the ca- and the cancer cells are taking this information and doing something and just somehow, or the organism is taking it, or or or. And remember, it's not even hands-on healing. Think Australia. That's true. Right. Right. Wow. So it, it's 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 reasonably nutty. So how many and people, people? You know, and and you know, people people all over the place are doing this. It's 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 kind of interesting. Now, how many people have um, have gone through your work and have obtained healing? Do you think? Oh, I don't know. I was just down in North Carolina at a fundraiser, giving a talk, and about a hundred people were there. And and somebody stood up and said, just out of curiosity, I didn't know any of them. Uh-huh. How many people here have been cured by my method? And, and about sixty hands went up. Wow! I was flabbergasted. I didn't know them. I didn't do them. These are people learning my technique. Now, are you scared or aware of or using that word cure? Are you, have, you know, have you thought about, you know, the big pharma doesn't like that, right? Yeah, I, I don't care. I'm not doing big pharma. I'm doing my own little <laughs> corner of the world. And if I have a downloadable app, I got a downloadable app. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not scared in any way, shape, or form. I love that. Gosh, what yeah. a bizarre thing this whole thing is, right? I mean, yeah. you ever just kind of wake up and think, what what the heck is going on with all this? And you, if I were writing fiction, I'd never come up with this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's seriously out there. Yeah, yeah. 
Wow. So you've done, let's see, sheep, pigs, um, mice, horses, horses. cats, dogs, you know, you name it. We, we, we've done it. But I mean, the, the, the interesting, I, I spend my time in the lab now, you uh-huh. know, trying to get to the underlying mechanisms. And folks who want to fix other folks, um, they, they take my workshops, so they, you know, take listen and learn the stuff on the CDs or, you know, something like that. I don't, ha- I don't have any proprietary secrets. Mm-hmm. So in terms of people that do apply this hands-on healing, whether it's physical or some- on someone that's far away, and there isn't a result, um, wh- what are your thoughts about that? You mean something like Parkinson's? Well, yeah, let's say they do it on Parkinson's or let's say someone that you teach, you know, does it on something else, on cancer or something that it should work on, but it di- it doesn't. Um, what are your thoughts about w- what's going on well, there? Well, the, the, there's, there's um, certainly there's extraneous variables that, that clearly matter. Uh, so, for example, uh, clinical failures have been associated with combining healing techniques with killing techniques. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they don't seem to go together well. So, for example, uh, if you're going to radiate uh, a cancer cell, you're, you're trying to kill the cells. If you're healing, you're trying to heal the cells. Mm-hmm. And healing, it sounds facetious, but I'm not trying to be, healing and killing may not be compatible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we haven't verified this in the lab uh, on, with experimental animals, but we certainly have clinical cases, and, and we've had complications, we'll say, or failures uh, when you combine healing and killing. Um, uh, we don't seem to have complications when there's no killing. Interesting. Okay, so when someone's not taking a substance that's going to be killing whatever their, their problem is, you have yeah. no results. If you're going to go kill, killing, I would recommend kill. You know, if you're going to go healing, I'd recommend go healing. We need to experimentally verify that, but it's, you know, it's an interesting... Any thoughts on why you think it doesn't work on warts? No, but it's something's going on that makes it real. That 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 as healers, you know, and again, I have trained a whole lot of people uh, doing this stuff. Uh, healers, um, uh, they tell me any idiot can do warts, and mm-hmm. I go, "That's fine," but this idiot can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they use my technique, they can't do it either. Mm-hmm. And and what this is another clue. It, it, into an area that nobody, as far as I'm aware, has ever looked into. So, for example, let's say you have healing. I don't know comparative healing stuff. I'm not a healer. I just research it and I teach it. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I don't study healing. You know, in any, you know, as healing, mm-hmm. I study the consequences of healing, and I'm trying to replicate it without the healer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, um, uh, let's say we call it healing technique X can do warts, but it can't do cancer. Mm-hmm. My technique can do cancer, but it can't do warts. That's interesting. Yeah. And so it's not, certainly, you can see it's not belief. Mm -hmm. Something real is going on. And something's different with different techniques. Uh, I don't know anybody who's looked into this. Rather, they get, you know, you get all schooled in this or that technique of healing, and then you become a defender of it, Mm. you know, as if... You know, you need to uh, sustain the belief or something like that. I mean, that's crazy talk. Right. So let's find out what works and what doesn't, and let's let's turn it into an arsenal of possibilities. So the the best for clinical folks, in in my opinion, you you get, for example, healers who've been longtime healers. They learn my technique, and now they can do cancer. Now that doesn't mean they use my technique for everything, and there's no contest. But if you've got cancer, use this. Mm-hmm. If you've got Alzheimer's, use this. If you got warts. Don't use this. Mm-hmm. So you're you're certifiably sure that it doesn't work with warts. Well, at least so far. So far, yeah. Yeah, so bizarre. It's not a rule because a rule would imply I know what I'm talking about. Right, right. But in a few hundred people, so far, not a wart has gone. So there there are interesting patterns. You lose the ability to do the wart, but if you switch to a different healing technique, you can get rid of the wart. Mm-hmm. And so a good clinician, as distinct from myself. Uh, I'm not, but a good clinician would use this technique for that condition and that technique for this condition. Yeah, they don't use Bankston all the time. They use it when it's appropriate. So what what future studies are you are you most excited about doing? 
Well, I got studies going on right now to see if uh, if if we have. Um, we're trying to figure out what it is we've recorded, mm-hmm. and we we're we're going to hopefully be moving up, uh, finish our cell studies this week, get up to my studies uh, next month, and then um, I don't know, maybe human trials. Wow, gosh, I it, wonder. It would be fun to have a downloadable cure. Oh, jeez, could you imagine? Yeah, it'd be fun. I can imagine. Gosh, and I think I, I'm shooting for. Like a, a buck ninety nine. A dollar ninety nine. Well, should you, should a cure cost more than that? I wasn't sure if you meant one hundred ninety nine, but I like that. A dollar ninety nine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anybody man. who is either working with me, or funding, or has to sign on to my stated inviolable rule. If we come up with a cancer cure, it can't cost more than 100 bucks. I like that. And it has to be sliding scale. Some yeah. people don't have 100 bucks. Mm-hmm. So give me 10. I don't have 10. Give me a buck. Give me a nickel. Yeah. Give me a penny a year for five years. Well, I was just reading the other day that um, the average cancer patient, I think, is worth... I think something in a, in the realm of seven hundred seventy five thousand dollars in terms of their their traditional cancer treatments, which is just crazy. Yeah, I think bringing that down to a buck ninety nine is a good thing. Yeah! Wow! What a crazy thing! So you're doing, you're completing, and doing more studies all the time on different all the time different okay. animals and things. Animals, cell cultures, all sorts of stuff. Trying to get, trying to tease this out. So what, what other aspects of human health do you think this would be applicable for or that you know that would be applicable for outside of like cancer and Alzheimer's and things? Uh, we can do allergies. Uh-huh. We can do arthritis. We can do cataracts. We can do some osteoporosis. We can do blood pressure. Mm-hmm. I mean, the list is pretty long. But then every now and then you you run up against something you just can't figure out why it doesn't uh, work. Well, so far nobody's nobody. You know, these are clinical folks taking taking my workshop and go out and trying to heal the sick and do all this kind of stuff. And uh, nobody's broken the Parkinson's barrier. Nobody's had a cure of type one diabetes. Oh right, 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 right. Uh, so that's that's again that's something you're missing. Mm-hmm. And we don't we. We've improved diabetes, but we haven't cured it. Mm-hmm. And Type I would one, right? say in Parkinson's, we haven't even appreciably improved it. It's, uh, it's, it's mocking us, <laughs> it's like yeah. the wart. Yeah, it's like sitting on the outside of the, uh, you know, out of the circle, just mocking you, kind of right. But that's a clue, you yeah. know. So, so there's something going on. It's just so far past my pay grade to date. So, uh, if but, someone, but I got all these clues there, and I just can't figure out. I I know that we're we're thinking about the question wrong. Just as anybody who thinks there's an energy is not thinking about this correctly. There's no energy out there. Well, um, it, there's no energy healing. There's informational transfers. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're thinking it's energy, you're going down the wrong path. Mm-hmm. There's a. We need to think about this in a very very different way. I don't know that way. You know, mm-hmm. I I need a sudden conceptual shift that, that a little help me to understand this. Well, but I figure in the meantime, even if I don't understand it, I can still use it as a technology and build a cure mm-hmm. and right. reverse engineer it. So you put 10 theoretical physicists in a room and you ask them what gravity is, you're going to have a, a chaotic, chaotic fight. <laughs> right. But I'm reasonably confident there's gravity. Uh-huh. Uh, and I can use it. And so I, if you put 10 researchers in healing into a room and ask them what it is, you're going to get into a fight. And some people actually think there's energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, whether there is or there isn't, I'm reasonably confident we can reverse engineer it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting what you're saying, too, in terms of information, because we've had guests on our show in, in the past you know, talk about water and things and, and food. And, and they say, really, it's not like what you're eating is vitamin C and your body's assimilating vitamin C. What you're doing is bringing in information that that food is carrying yep. or that water is carrying, and then yep. your body um, does something with that information and then discards the rest. So yep. this whole there idea you know. of information is really interesting. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. It's just, so I, we're I guess, offering a, a spectrum of possibilities 
and it's the healies problem to take what they need. In uh-huh. the same way, if you take a multivitamin, you're going to excrete most of it. Mm-hmm. But on Monday, you may take a little vitamin A, and on Tuesday, you may take a little vitamin C, and on Wednesday, you may take a little vitamin K, and you're going to excrete the rest. Uh-huh. I think healing is similarly a broad-spectrum offering, but it's the Healy's problem to take the missing information. So our listeners are probably listening to this trying to figure out um, if they learn the technique, how, how long of a process is it to learn? And then once they know the technique... Um, are there different protocols for how long you treat different issues, or how does all that work? Well, I don't have any fixed protocol because that would imply more information than anybody has. But uh-huh. uh, in terms of learning it, uh, there, there's two ways to learn the techniques. Um, one, one would be there, if you're in the New York area, for example, I'm giving a, a workshop in a month on Long Island. I've mm-hmm. uh, never done that before. And uh, I'll be out in California in January. Oh, really? Whereabouts? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't arrange all this stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think I'm actually giving two workshops in California. One in a, in a new um, Santa... No, I'm giving one in Santa Barbara down south. Okay. But before that, I'm giving one up on the coast outside of San Francisco, I think in a little south. Oh, interesting. Okay. There's apparently a, um, like a workshop place, and they've invited me to come and, and, and do the thing. That'll be in January. You can, you can look this stuff up on my website. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm just at bankstonresearch.com, but I, I never look at the website, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I've got a mid-July one in on Long Island, and I also have one in uh, just out of, outside of Buffalo. I think at the end of July. Oh wow! Uh, and and anyway, people can look that up. So what, door number one is in answer to your question, which again, you know, I eventually get to. But um, in answer to your question, the the training is really about three days, and you don't come out of this mastering. You really come out of this knowing the technique. But then you need to practice it. Okay. So, uh, I mean, let's say I, I give you three days' worth of tennis lessons and you've never played tennis before. Um, you're going to know the basics. Of this is the forehand and this is it, but you're not going to be an expert. Mm-hmm. But you'll know how to drill and practice and to, and then folks who are serious about it, um, uh, they, they, they can. They learn it at different rates, mm-hmm. but they, everybody will know at the end of a workshop how to do it, um, and then they decide whether it's worth it. Uh, so, th- there's other way to do it is on a CD set that you can buy, I think, on Amazon. I don't actually don't know, but it's from Sounds True, and it's called uh, Hands-On Healing, a training course in the Energy Cure. Okay. And that was made explicitly just to give away all the techniques. Oh, wow. Okay. So the group in North Carolina has apparently, I just found out, has been doing this stuff and doing healings for four years. I oh, didn't know wow. that. Wow. I got groups in Freiburg, uh, Germany. I got groups in California, in Chicago. And, and so there, there are folks in, 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 in a variety of places where people get together and they, they practice on each other, then they take on clients, and they, then they, then they, you know, like that. So it wow. depends on the group. But the training itself is about three days. That's fascinating. And so if someone is working on their on you know a friend of theirs or a family member um does it usually take like five minutes an hour like what what are the oh yeah oh you're asking how long does an actual treatment take yeah yeah you got to get past the idea that this has anything to do with like magic you know or 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 things like that Uh my the the five minute job on my back was an exception and it it varies uh very much um from an experimental point of view uh, with mice and cell cultures we varied the dosage in a clinical view, I, I recommend, if anything, you're over-treating, you know. So it, mm-hmm. it, 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 it varies very much. If you've got a very aggressive malignancy, it's probably going to leave pretty quick. Mm-hmm. But exactly how many treatments it's going to take, uh, I follow medical advice. In other words, if you've been diagnosed with using a particular technique, uh, whether it be a MRI or an X-ray or a blood test, you'll know when to stop when, when all of those things show it to be normal. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting, too, because you could have given up with the mice when you first tried this, right, back in the day. You, you could have given up when, when you weren't seeing any results. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah. And, and, and this is one of the things that I didn't see coming, which is essentially all of everything I've done. But uh, one of the things I didn't see coming, uh, I was thinking of, well, you give a treatment, I'll see what happens. You know, but, but nothing happens for a while, and then suddenly there's a change. It's, it's kind of like a phase transition. Uh, you get a sudden change from this to that. Uh, you can think of uh, water. Mm -hmm. uh, you got water, and you make it colder, and you make it colder, and you make it colder, and you got a bunch of cold water. But if you just go a little bit more, it becomes a solid. That's right. a phase transition. Okay. Healing seems to be the same way. It doesn't proceed in a nice, simple, linear fashion. It's, it goes to phase transition. So if I've got mice and I stopped because I said, no, they got bumps, and I didn't want them to have bumps, well, t in my head, I failed, you know, but... Nature is doing it. It's, nature doesn't conform to my will. Nature conforms to, I don't know, that's the fun of doing research. <laughs> I love your open mind. That's so crazy. That's awesome. And, uh, doing cell cultures. We did, for example, uh, studies at UC um, San Diego uh, mm -hmm. at the med school there on cell cultures on human leukemia cells. If we treat the medium, the nutrients in which cells are grown, what does it do to cancer cells? And at the end of the first week, cancer cell, we, in other words, we're holding the bottle of the treated medium, and then we ship them across the country, and then the, the, the lab does what it normally does, and they grow cancer cells. Mm -hmm. At the end of the first week, if we compare the one's cells who have been grown in the treated medium and those that haven't, there's nothing, nothing happened. And you would say, well, nothing happened. But in the second week, suddenly they explode. Wow. So, and so nothing, medium. nothing, nothing, blam. Yeah. And just think like ice. Colder, yeah. colder, colder, solid. Mm -hmm. Wow. What's so and, fast. And where that phase, the, a phase transition is coming, but there's too much variation and there's too little that we know to make a prediction about it. Mm -hmm. So it, when, when you, you come and take my workshop and you learn the, the healing technique and, and the reasonable question would be exactly what you asked, mm -hmm. how long do I have to do this? And the answer is until it's fixed. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's no, there's no way of knowing, like you just said. I mean, there's no, no. way of knowing when that, when no. that final phase is going to transition at all. No. I mean, think of the arrogance yeah. of making a prediction like that. Yeah. I, it, it's past me. And especially with humans that are so diverse, you know. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So what 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 you do to the mice? Nothing, 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 nothing cured. What you do to the cell culture? Nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, blam. You know, it's 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 uh, healing isn't doesn't conform to our will. It doesn't conform to our wishes. It doesn't conform to you know. It's it's, it's nature doing nature, and uh, she's a curious uh, <laughs> person. <laughs> well, you know, it's like fascinating. Screw with our heads. You know, it's, likes to screw with our heads, and that's fun. Oh, that's I know, and that that's the that's the name of the game, and it's fun to research that. Just you know, to I find just, out, I can't wait to find out this week all the stuff I didn't know. So, if this my data coming in in the next week, and we we do this interview, compare this to what I'll know a week from now, it'll be different. Oh wow, that's crazy. You know what yeah. I found fascinating is that when you're performing the technique on the mice, um, the first time you did it. For 16 days with no result, and not only no result, but the 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 mice were getting worse and worse and worse. Yep. It's interesting. I'm curious if if you were God or if you were the all higher power that you knew exactly how everything worked in the universe. I wonder what was going on. It almost seems like you were chipping away at something, but you couldn't see it. I I, I still can't see it. Yeah. I still can't see it. Well, so. you can see it because they they got. You know, their their tumors went away, right? Yeah, but now you say to me before, how come you can't do a wart? And I just, you know, flop on the floor and say, <laughs> I got nothing. I mean, literally, I got nothing. That's funny. But just behaviorally or as a consequence, so far nobody has been able to do a wart in my system, even if they could do it using other techniques. Wow. So strange. Gosh. It's real. Well, but it's... It's really complex. Yeah. And if I can make it downloadable, what the hell? Then everybody can play. I know, right? Well, Bill, thank you for being on the show, and uh, thanks for being a skeptic, and thanks for <laughs> all your research and your clear mind. I, I, it's awesome. Thanks for being on today. Thank you, and I wish you nothing but skepticism. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Hang on the line there really quickly, and I'm going to close out the show. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will put links to... 
some of the different items, especially his website, as well as the book, even though he doesn't want to call it this, The Energy Cure, Unraveling the Mystery of Hands-On Healing, as well as uh, with Hands-On Healing, a training course in the Energy Cure CD. We'll put links to that and his website at extremehealthradio.com slash 529. You guys rock. Thank you so much for listening. We love each and every one of you. Um, I'll be back after uh, to do a recap, but thanks for joining us. We love you, and we'll catch you guys on the next episode. I have been a huge fan of rebounding for many, many years. And if you want to get in great cardiovascular shape, tone your legs, back and butt and stomach, as well as cleanse your lymphatic system from toxins and chemicals, you just have to start rebounding. It's imperative. And not only will it create endorphins that quickly become addictive to you, but it's very low impact as well. It helps to prevent sicknesses and diseases as well as increase bone density and it flushes toxins from your lymphatic system. It's amazing. And not only that, but it's a ton of fun also. I do it every single day for about 15 minutes. And we found the best rebounder on the market today in the world bar none. It's called the Bellicon Rebounder. It's the Rolls Royce of rebounders in my opinion. And let's listen to some of what our guests have had to say about rebounding. Robert von Sarbacher is a health researcher and creator of the Mini B Protocol. And Robert, what's your favorite exercise? Uh, in general, uh, okay, probably one of the number one anti-aging exercises on the planet is is uh, rebounding. So 15 minutes a day is good for, for that. You can find people who uh, have had thermography scans on cancers, uh, giant tumors, and when they're doing a um, rebounder, it would start spewing out and shrinking right in front of your eyes, the tumor would, as they're on the rebounder. So it's really good for that sort of thing. It's also very good for exercising internal organs. It's the only internal organ exerciser that I know of known to man. Dr. Lindsay Duncan is the CEO and founder of Genesis Today. And what's the best way that you think of to stimulate the lymphatic system of the body? Rebounding is incredible because it's good for the lymphatic system and there's more lymph fluid in the body than there is blood. And the quickest way and the most effective way to get the lymphatic system flowing is through rebounding itself. Yeah, because the lymphatic system can't really detox itself, can it? I think you know. No, the heart, we have the heart, thank you, for pumping blood. And we don't have a heart to pump lymphatic fluid. The only thing that really can pump lymphatic fluid is cardiovascular exercise utilizing the thighs, the thigh muscles. And that's why rebounding and getting a burn in that thigh muscle is so important for the flow and the stimulation of the lymphatic fluid. Wow. And they even put cancer patients on rebounding, don't they? Nutritionists do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but not a conventional doctor. But yeah, I've been learning about rebounding lately. It's quite an amazing thing. Yeah, rebounding is amazing. Health researcher and author of Cancer Step Outside the Box, Ty Bollinger. What do you do in your life to prevent cancer? What do you do to treat cancer? What do you do to prevent it? Rebounding is something that I try to do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, a little mini trampoline for those people that aren't familiar with the term rebounding. But it's basically just jumping up and down on that little mini tramp. Mm -hmm. What that does is it stimulates the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is one of our primary detoxification systems in our body. And most folks don't stimulate their lymph flow, and so their the toxicity in their body builds up because their lymph is not stimulated. And the up down motion on a rebounder stimulates the lymph flow better than just about any other exercise. So mm -hmm. I do that almost almost on a daily, probably five days a week. I would say I average doing that. And finally, author and speaker and creator of the Longevity Now program, David Wolf. Do you think the Bellicon is the best rebounder on the market today? Absolutely. I I was just with the crew in Europe that does the Bellicon Rebounder, which is an incredible rebounder. My God, what a machine. Mm -hmm. And it's, it doesn't use metal springs. It uses like flexi ropes. So it's very soft and fun and it's just great to play with. Well, there you have it. The up and down G-force actually stimulates every single cell in your body. It's incredible. And as someone who works out in the gym a lot and does Qigong, I think that the best physical aerobic exercise, in my opinion, is rebounding. It's just absolutely incredible for the human body. And the Bellicon is silent, and it comes with a warranty. And you can get them in several different sizes and colors. And some of them have bars that you can hold on to in case you're worried about balance. It's a well worth it investment in your health and in your future. 
So check them out in our store if you'd like, or you can check out the videos on extremehealthradio.com forward slash Bellicon. Again, that's extremehealthradio.com forward slash Bellicon. That's B as in boy, E-L-L-I-C-O-N. Wow, that was a that was a show for the ages, right? Episode 529 with Dr. Bill Bankston. Bankstonresearch.com. All right, what do you guys think about that? We have a lot of different people in our um, network and, and, you know, a lot of thousands and thousands of people that listen around the world. And some people are very open. Some people, maybe some people are open too much. Maybe some people, uh, you know, are just kind of believe any anything that comes along. Some people are very skeptical. And if you're anything like me, you're going to be skeptical of that interview. Um, but... You know what? It's one thing, like we said, to be skeptical with the intention of having an open mind versus being a skeptical uh, with being held on or holding on to skepticism itself. And a lot of people are like that. They just want to be skeptical. They want to be the contrarian. They want to be the one person that doesn't believe like everybody else believes. So with all of that said, I'm curious, what do you guys think about that show? Did you... Did you like what he was saying? Do you think that what he was saying is true? Um, I would like to read his book, actually, The Energy Cure. It's funny he doesn't even like the word energy. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he said something that was interesting during the show that made me think about that because he said energy, at least in the way that we understand it. So maybe there is energy, but it's not in the way that we can quantify it or measure it uh, in the in a in a scientific method the way we do now. So maybe um, there is energy, but we just don't know how to understand it. But what I thought he said was interesting about information and how all of this stuff works with information. You know what I thought was really weird though was why is it that. He couldn't do anything with warts or Parkinson's. And what he said was interesting about the Alzheimer's. What did he say? He said, let me try to figure this out. He said, with Parkinson's, something's missing. Well, with Alzheimer's, it's an accumulation of something, right? Is that what he said? So Alzheimer's, is an, is, it's an actual accumulation of what natural doctors will say, you know, heavy metals and things like that. So when you have an accumulation of whatever that is, then a healing method could remove those. And that makes sense. But when you have something like Parkinson's, which he said, I I forget what exactly he said, but it's, it's the, it's the, it's a disease where you're missing something. And so when you're missing something, it's challenging to restore something, whatever's causing the, the Parkinson's to restore using energy medicine. So maybe there's something there. But then the same would have to be said about warts, right? So warts, since it doesn't work on warts, then warts, maybe you're missing something. It's interesting, interesting. Trying to figure all this stuff out, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm of the belief myself that it's it it helps to, I kind of disagree with him in the sense that he was saying, I mean, I understand being in that neutral place, right? Uh, uh, That zero point where you can you know, take things either direction. But um, I'm I'm of the belief that it's important to believe in the treatment that you're getting. That's just my opinion. But he said that was actually a, a limiting factor for this, to actually believe it, because then you have to, you know, defend beliefs. And I, and I get that, and that makes sense. But, you know, if you're getting chemotherapy, for example, um, and you don't know any better, Sometimes it's better to to not know anything and believe in the doctors as much as you possibly can to think that the chemotherapy and radiation and surgery is gonna gonna work for you. I mean, if anyone should be flying the flag of traditional medicine, it should be me. Because my mom, if you guys don't know, the reason why I got into natural health and natural healing and all this kind of stuff was because of my mom. My mom in 1995, at the age of 55 years old, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stage four, I think. Uh, she had less than a 10% chance of survival. Um, and she, we didn't know anything at the time. We didn't, we knew nothing. And so she went to the city of hope and had chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and a bone marrow transplant. And I donated platelets because I was the only, 
um, matching family member. No one else matched. My dad didn't match or n- neither did my brother. Excuse me. And I was the only match for playlists. So I drive up to City of Hope, which is like an hour and a half away a couple times a week uh, and donate platelets for two or three hours. So, you know, that's what I did. And she went through bone marrow transplant with that. And she went through chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, all of it. And I saw her go through what was the most horrific treatment of a disease I've ever seen in my life. And it was, it was after that, that I thought to myself, man, this is a, it's not normal to have cancer and why are so many people getting cancer and B, this can't be the only way of healing cancer and there has to be a way of preventing it. This can't just be the plague of our time where we have no idea. I mean, after 30 years or it's been more than 30 years now, 40 years, 45 years of, you know, President Nixon in 1971 declaring the war on cancer and how we're going to have a cancer cured and all this kind of stuff then why are all these people getting cancer, you know? And so I, I, I thought about, and I watched my mom go through this and lose her hair and become so weak and couldn't walk after, you know, 10 or 15 feet. And I thought to myself, man, this is just, this is barbaric. There's something. But with all of that, she had less than a 10% chance of survival. And she's still here. She's still here. Um, you know, 20 plus years later, 22 years later. So... If anyone should be flying the flag of traditional medicine, it's me. But with that said, I still think that there's better ways. There are better ways. And, you know, if people can find better ways, then I think that's the way to do it. I think um, it's less toxic, less stressful, um, less of a burden on the body than going through chemotherapy and radiation. So um, what I did think was interesting about um, Bill Bankston here was that he wasn't didn't seem to be concerned much at all about using the word cure. And I, I like that because if any of you guys have been following, um, what is her name? Erin Elizabeth over at health net news and all of these people being these doctors being what some people think to be killed because they have quote cures for cancer. Um, you know, it's, um, it's distressing, right? You look at that and you think, Oh my gosh, what is going on? What's happening with these people? So, but I like people that are just kind of heads down, focused, doing their work, and however the chips fall, the chips fall. And uh, so I don't know if there's if there's um, if there's truth to what he was saying. Um, you know, I like to think so. All I know is you know anyone can come on and say anything. So it's up to us to 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 verify and to to look into things and to study things and to and to. Um, you know, buy into whatever our guests are saying. So that's sort of what my job is here and your job is, is to come together and to figure things out on our own and and make things uh, work for us individually. So if you found uh, some truth to that, or if you found some, you know, if you resonate with what he was saying, then go over to bankstonresearch.com and check out his, his books or his CD and you can learn more there. I'll put a link to all that stuff at extremehealthradio.com slash 529. And just so you guys know, um, I wanted to let you guys know there is a, um, we're working on a, a membership community. So if you guys want to dive deeper into all the different talk- topics that we talk about here on the show, um, it's not for everyone. This is going to be a paid membership community, but it's for those of us that want to take our health to new levels and to sort of put yourself on a program um, overseen by doctors and you can communicate with other people to hold you accountable to really get really amazing results with your own healing and hopefully once you're healed of different whatever you're dealing with i shouldn't say healed once you your body has overcome these things um and then you can start taking your health to new levels so uh, we're going to be starting a membership academy for those that want to dive deeper and we're going to be doing courses on every organ of the body so we'll be doing a course on the brain the liver the lungs the thyroid the colon the intestines, the stomach. We'll be doing courses in depth on all these things with different doctors and health practitioners. But we're also going to be doing um, courses on on specific challenges like you know um, cancer or um, digestion or heart health or things you know different diseases that people have, arthritis and and things. So we're going to be diving very deep into these subjects so that you can get the actual practical how to hands on approach. Um, and options that you will never hear anywhere else 
Um, so this is going to be an awesome place and it's going to be the place for you guys to, to dive deeper and for me to, uh, communicate with you more directly. So I'm looking forward to that. So if you're interested in that, that'll be available. I'll put a link to the members, uh, website academy. It's not launched yet. We're going to be launching, um, so far we think around the end of September of 2017. So, uh, if this is, if you're listening to this after that, then we should be, we, we should have launched by then. Uh, if not, you can get on the waiting list. And you know what I would do? I would recommend getting on the waiting list. We're not going to email you uh, until maybe a couple weeks before we launch. So we're not going to be sending emails to you. But the benefit of being on the waiting list is that we're going to be launching at such an incredibly crazy discounted price uh, that will never be offered again. So if you want at least the option of getting into the community at, at the lowest price possible, get on our waiting list and then you can decide from there. So um, thank you guys for your support. We love you guys over the years. You guys are amazing. Thank you for those of you who have been purchasing through our Amazon link. Uh, in case you don't know, on our website, if you go on the right-hand side of our website, there's a, a banner for Amazon. Just below that, there's some text. If you grab that text and drag it to your desktop on a PC or a Mac, uh, on your desktop, it'll create a little icon. And if you can just use that icon, double-click that every time you make an Amazon purchase, it'll just open up your default browser and that will go through our affiliate link and then you will uh, be supporting the show that way. So we appreciate that. That helps us a lot. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, thank you also for sharing our shows and um, thank you for shopping through our store. If you guys don't know, we have a ton of uh, really unique products in our store. Um, really, really unique stuff. So if you guys are interested in cutting edge health tools and gadgets and, and juicers and rebounders and saunas and all kinds of really cool things, uh, check out our store from time to time and uh, purchase through that, and then that will help support the show too. Okay, as an FYI, if you've missed any of the recent shows or if you're a first-time listener, some of the couple of recent shows we've had, one is with Patrick Durkin, and that was about structured water. That was an interesting, interesting show. Uh, we also had Gerald Pollack, also about water, about the fourth phase of water. Uh, we had Susan Chan, and she talked about healing Lyme disease. Um, what else do we have? Oh, upcoming shows. We've got Mr. Adam Bergstrom, and he'll be talking about body dowsing. Fascinating, fascinating guy. He talks about chronobiotic nutrition, which is eating food in time at the right time. So he's really, he's one of our most fascinating guests, Adam Bergstrom. Uh, and then we have the paleocardiologist, Dr. Jack Wolfson. So we'll be talking about the paleo diet and its effect on the heart. And, um, so we got a lot of cool stuff coming up. So if you guys would like to support the show, a great way to do that is, uh, through all of our amazing, amazing, amazing Patreon members. You guys are amazing. So if you want to go over to Patreon and donate a dollar a month or five bucks a month, whatever you think is, is the show's worth it to you. Um, we would appreciate that. That helps, uh, support the show and keep everything free for everybody else. So your purchases through Amazon, your purchases through our store and through Patreon really help support the show. So we appreciate you guys a lot. Um, let us know if we can ever help you guys and uh, make sure to check out the Academy when it becomes available. And we'll put links to all this stuff at, let me get it right, extremehealthradio.com slash 529. And you'll be able to check out the sponsors for this show too, if you're interested in that. All right, guys, we love you. We'll catch you guys on the next episode. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or